Good evening, everyone. Hey, good evening, Suki. How are you? Good evening, oh, Mr. Tom. Good. Good evening, Tom. Good to see you. Good evening, Mr. Thomas. That is an interesting hat. Can everybody hear me right now? Tom, can you hear me? I can I can hear you. Harvey Savage? Yes. How are you doing? Hi. Nice to nice to see you. you. I Pat? am I am with uh I'm with uh Colin Cohen's uh project uh One Clove in Crown Heights. Okay. Hey. Good evening, Mr. Um, Savage. You're not on the agenda this evening, so there will not be um, an option to, to present anything this evening. Oh, there's not? Uh, I thought it was January 9th. Um, well, you were never, never finalized on the agenda. Okay. Yeah, also, we never, we never heard anything from you. Um, you know, usually yeah. I get an email from the board office if somebody wants to present. I know yeah. Mr. Colin had Mr. Cohen had been up there meeting with you guys. I thought it was. Okay. Well, he attended our December meeting, but he didn't meet with us. Uh, and he directly. didn't say anything about the project either. He yeah. just said something along the lines of like, oh, you're all so great. Carry on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Mr. Savage, maybe we should connect tomorrow. And yes. I'll uh, um, pull Suki in so we can discuss uh, any submissions you need to have before the committee for the February meeting. Okay, cool. And what what date is the February meeting? Um, hold on. I believe it is February thirteenth. It is the second Tuesday. Okay. Okay, don't you, Mr. Savage? Is this a is this a development project? Yes. Okay. And has it been filed um yet, or is this an as of right project? Uh, well, as of right. Okay. Yeah, so okay. we, we, we yeah, just as of right and uh and we and we fall in the guidelines for the zoning because um we know we're just looking for a fresh market and we know that you we can do forty thousand and it's already twenty one in a neighboring building, so we just wanted to get fifteen thousand square feet of fresh oh. produce. So you're looking for a fresh authorization. Yes. I okay. see. Yeah, let's connect okay. tomorrow. Um, okay. See where you're at in your application process, so we can get you scheduled for February. Okay, cool. If you say February thirteenth would be the next one. Yes. Okay. So cool. if you can give the board office a call tomorrow, yeah, we're in after line, and let's connect and discuss where you are in your in the process, so we okay. can get cool. you together. Okay. Thank you so All much, right. Mr. Savage. Oh, thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um, now, Mia, do I have host privileges at this point? Am I signed in as a host? Let me give that to you. I'm also going to ask anyone who's calling in from a number to identify themselves. We had some Zoom bombers yesterday. So if you can please unmute yourself and so that we can name you appropriately in the meeting. And if you are uncomfortable with doing so, please advise as well, because we will be live streaming if you just care to watch and not participate. Um, could the 917 number and in, in 2804 identify themselves? And could also the 615 number identify themselves? Unmute yourself.
Okay, so uh, it's 7.05. I'm going to get started. I think we've got all of the committee members here, except for Esteban. I hope he'll be joining us later. Um, but I know he wasn't feeling well last night. Um, so uh, just, you know, about rules of order and the um, speaking time and our agenda, um, we, you know, we, we need to end on time, but we do have, you know, as usual, a full agenda. Um, so what we're going to do is after the committee, everybody, you know, there's been a lot of crosstalk in, in the meetings, a lot of interjections. This is taking up time. People find this rude. Um, so I am keeping everybody on mute until I call on you. You just need to raise your hand and um, we'll call on you and then we will unmute you. Um, we will start with committee member updates um, for about five to 10 minutes. Um, following that, we will have a public comment session um, where members of the public should raise their hands at the beginning of the session if they want to speak. And Mia, are you able to help with the timekeeping and for the speakers this evening, or should we ask for a committee volunteer? No, I can assist. Okay. Well, so, what is um, the time, time limit being placed on uh, questions being posed? Yeah. So what? at that point, um, you know, when when members of the public have raised their hand to indicate that they want to speak, um, you know, if you could write them down in 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 the order that you see the hands go up and then call on people, um, depending on how many people would like to speak, we can do a time limit of either two minutes or three minutes until either the speaker's list is exhausted or 20 minutes have passed, whichever is earlier. Um, I think two minutes would be ideal. Three minutes is a Three bit minutes, more. okay. Yeah. Um, following that, we will go into our business session because we would like to discuss and pass a resolution on the Green Fast Track Amendment. This is something that is happening very quickly. The city released it a couple of weeks ago, but the City Planning Commission will be hearing it on February 7th, which means that if the board wants to have anything to say as a board, we need to do that by the end of the month. And since we're the only committee that um, appears to be taking this up, uh, we need to get a resolution out of committee if we want it to go to the general board. Um, so following, you know, what, once we take care of that during the business session, however long that takes, I don't think it'll be a long resolution. It'll be a short resolution. Um, then we can go back to public session um, to discuss, to continue discussing our land use framework. Um, uh, I, I would expect that we should maybe devote about 30 minutes to the business session. And just as a reminder, during the business session, members of the public can stay and listen, but they would not be speaking. So please, if you're a member of the public here and you have a comment to make, particularly on Green Fast Track, um, please make sure you put up your hand at the start of the public session so that you have your three minutes to comment. We do absolutely value your contribution, but we also need to get through our agenda. Okay, so with that being said, um, let's start with the committee member updates. Does anybody, oh, and Esteban is here with us. Um, we're just starting with committee member updates. Does anybody have anything they want to share with us? Nicola? Hi, this is a, just asking for clarification. Um, in past meetings, committee meetings, we never had a public session versus business session. So is this something new to the committee? Because I thought committees were working sessions with between the community and the committee. Uh, yes, this we is usually get thing that... valuable information from resident members and community members. So to block them out of discussions on, for instance, um, the, the green the green fast track, I think is a disservice. 
So this is a new thing that we're trying because there's been so much pressure to end meetings on time and that is not happening um, because there's, you know, it, it, it it's just very difficult to get through voting items um, with the constant interjections and back and forth, um, you know, but this is a matter of priorities for the group. If the priority is to leave on time, um, to stick to an agenda and to get things passed, then, you know, this is the way that we're that we're going to get it done. And there will be plenty of time during the public comment session for members of the public to comment. It's so this is the thing that we're it's trying to comment Absolutely. before the actual discussion has taken place. I mean, you can come with your scripted comments, but then we have a working session where we're putting together resolution, language, et cetera. I mean, this is a working, I yes. thought, a working committee. Yes, absolutely. And that is actually one of the reasons that we do need to have the business session, because, you know, the more, as they say, the more cooks in the kitchen, the bigger of a mess it's going to be. And so, you know, even this committee is not tiny um, in order for us to be able to write something and get it passed. Um, we are going to need to limit discussion. And so that unfortunately does mean limiting it to committee members. And that's how all committees are gonna be working now? Um, no, this is something new that we're trying for ULERP because ULERP tends to have a lot more participation. Um, there's a lot kind of chunkier issues to discuss. Um, you know, we're going to try it and see how it works. And yeah, I just think we need like to be realistic about our agendas. Our agendas have been, I mean, we, we know there are going to be times when we have, um, we may have a lengthy meeting because we have a lot of content. But to stick um, housing at the end of a DCP presentation yesterday was really unreasonable, given everything else that we've been doing over the last few months. I think we've been very effective as a subcommittee and as a ULIP committee. We've gotten a lot of work done over the last few months. But it's come as a cost, and we need to be cognizant of it and, and when possible, scale down the agenda items to make sure that we can be effective in covering all of the topics without having people here for three hours. I agree, Nicola. I was not in favor of holding um, a DCP presentation on the same night, but I but was we had no choice. Place. So since we had no choice and since housing has not, the clock has not started on housing yet. It, it so has. We had time. AAS was released. Yeah, but they still have to go through an environmental review, don't they? They already did the EAS. The EIS. Okay, but anyway, let, let's let's you know. In the interest of uh -huh. moving on, um, I see uh -huh. other hands. Yaakov. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm just I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I, I'm a little late. It's been a tough few days. You want to now have, have public comment at the beginning of every meeting. And then restrict and, and limit business section to business section. Is that what you're saying? Yes. If we have voting items or resolutions that we need to get through, we'll have a business session to deal with that. But otherwise, it will be um, the same as it was before. We're just going to limit speaker time. So why do we need public comment at the beginning? Um we always do that. It's just general community concerns. But if you guys want me to eliminate that. I'm saying, the that's right now, then I will. The, according to the bylaws, it's needed for for uh, it's needed for for the the full board meetings. It also needed for committee meetings. It's not needed for committee so meetings, I, but I, it's I, an I mean, option for us so, to do business sessions. So this, is the, this is the problem. I mean, I think you're gonna have to. Yeah, you've been look at the agenda. You see if there's time. You're gonna start having public comment once you start that. You have 20 people signed up. We're gonna be adding to the meetings, not shortening the meetings. No, because we're going to have a time limit for public comment. After you now, you have to be reasonable, right? So if it's two minutes a person, if ten people sign up, you you add twenty minutes to the meeting. Well, you know, let let's let's see, you know, let's see what I the situation is. I, I, don't I, think I, I personally, so listen, you could do what you want, but I'm personally on the record saying I oppose instituting a a 
public comments uh, session at the beginning is just going to add more time. I think like every other, if it's not required, if there's time for community participation, fine. If there's not time, there's not time. I just don't think, I mean, unless there's a special issue that's of extreme importance and you want to have general inputs, so you feel there's a need, fine. But just to start instituting this as part of the, the meeting, I mean, if to sit through, I mean, we do it by the full board. It just, it just, it's going to be the same thing as the full board meeting. It's going to, it's going to be a half an hour, half an hour every month. So you want us to go um, straight to I, business I, session, Yako? I hate to interject, and excuse me, Suki. Yeah. You guys have to come to a consensus because literally we're 15 minutes in. I'd like to start the meeting, go straight, management. To, go straight to business. Now. That's so it. we have our individual opinions. You guys need to come to a quick consensus and get going. It's 715. Okay. So I'm willing Thanks. to do one of two things. Um, we can start with the business session right away. And then after the business session, move to an open discussion on the land use framework. Um, or uh, we can do what I originally suggested, which is to start with public comments, including on Green Fast Track, move to the business session on Green Fast Track, and then return to a public session. So, um, you know, I'll take a show of hands from committee members who prefers the first and who prefers the second. Yaakov and Pat, you have your hands up. Does that mean you prefer the first option that we skip public comment entirely and move straight to a business session at this point? All right, that's what I prefer, but I, I don't know the second part of it, having community discussion, you have to do it depends on the time. I'm not voting that. You could, you could include it if you want to. But yes, it, it, that, that, that's the implication that once we're finished with our business session, then we can devote the remaining time to community, um, to an open discussion among community members mm -hmm. and community. I don't oppose that. Okay. Pat? Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. I I, I, I basically have a, a problem with how it's being set up. This is a a meeting that we all get together, you know, and that's why we have an agenda. The agenda is planned out. And so to have a public session as if we're doing a regular board meeting to me is not appropriate i think that if you're chairing you have your your agenda set out which i did for three years you have old business you discuss you have new business you discuss and then you have what we discuss and then we have community who wants to bring in whatever it is to go on and on and on makes no kind of sense and I think that this is a business session. I don't think it should be looking like we're doing a regular board meeting. And that's okay. my And I don't so understand, you... wait a minute, I don't understand why you say there's not enough time. I did it for three years, had people come in. There's always enough time if you set your agenda up. Okay, so you're in favor of us moving straight to a business session at this point, similar to you. No, I'm in favor of you doing an agenda. We have an agenda, okay. and the agenda right and now whatever is your, whatever your time is for old business and new business. With when, when we're when we're meeting, and we're talking, to other people will just wait, and then they'll come in. But I, I okay. like to so you are you are so you here. so you are effectively saying that the entire session is a business session where the public doesn't speak. Yeah, the public does uh, speak. Were you at my meetings for the last three years? Didn't the public speak? All I'm saying is that it has to be a little bit more organized. That's all I'm saying. It has to be. And the reason that you don't have enough time is because you, people are going north and south. Let's stay on the agenda and move on. And you can time that. Okay. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to start with the committee discussion of the Green Fast Track Amendment. Um, once the committee has discussed it, if any members of the public have comments, they can give comments. Uh, we're gonna give until eight o'clock for this, and then the committee is going to vote. But in that time, the committee members need to come up with a resolution. That is not easy to do 
and incorporate public comment in 40 minutes. That's why I'm suggesting that we put the public comment separately and then we work on the resolution together. But if you guys think that you can get this done in 40 minutes together, then let's go, let's start and go ahead and do that. Well, first of all, we have to agree on a resolution. So to say we're gonna do something and it hasn't been planned out makes absolutely no sense to me. But hey, I'm out. That's precisely the issue, Pat. That's why I want us to have a public comment session first, followed by our discussion and making up the resolution. It's it's not an easy thing to do in 40 minutes, unless it's very, very organized. John. John. Yeah, sorry. I was uh, dealing with the laggy uh, permission to speak. So, um, you know, I, I, Suki, I recognize what you're trying to do here. I think last night's meeting was uh, there were a lot of uh, people that were outside the community that joined in and really dragged out the whole time. So I appreciate what you're trying to do here. I do think we have a, just a few members of pe few community members that have joined tonight. So I don't think if we allow the community to speak first, it'll add too much time. I think as, if everyone is disciplined and keeps to their two minutes, um, I think we could get through that public uh, comment period fairly quickly. So that's my that's my recommendation. I, I defer to, I think, your position as chair to dictate how these go. I do see you have an agenda here and you've got community concerns as item number three. So I think we should follow your agenda. Okay. Okay, um, can I have a show of hands from the community members who would like to speak? Mr. Hollingsworth? Is there anyone besides Mr. Hollingsworth who would like to speak? And and when I say community members, this this includes other board members um, who are joining us tonight, like Mena or Rod. Do do either of you want to speak um, on any of our agenda, on our green fast track agenda tonight? Uh, not right now, Suki. I don't have anything to, to state at this moment. Okay. Okay. So um, if it's essentially just Sky, Sky, you're also raising your hand um, to participate in the public discussion? Yes. Hi, I'm Skylar White. I had just joined, so apologies for being late. Um, I was also just looking for a few of my team members. Um, I did not see the agenda, but um, I was told that we could present a project. I'm, I'm here on um, behalf of Carl Cohen and he has a project and I don't know if- Yeah, I, I, actually if um, somebody appeared earlier and um, Mia asked him to connect with her afterwards. Um, we were not told about this. Hi, Sky. Um, I Mr. Savage uh, appeared earlier in the meeting um, you guys will be scheduled for the February meeting. Uh, we just have to confirm that certain applications have been filed and where you guys are in the process to deem if you're appropriate to be presenting anything in front of the committee just yet. Okay, so Mena and Michael, you're, Mena, you're raising your hand that you want to speak. And tonight. Suki, can I just interject really yes. quickly? We're, we're It's almost 7.30. We, did, we have to get going. I think you should just okay. start presenting. What okay, we're doing so fast. why don't we start with public comment? Um, Mr. Hollingsworth, you're up first. And Mia, if you can time, we'll give everyone three minutes. Mr. Hollingsworth? Yes, uh, thank you. I was trying to unmute, but I couldn't for some reason. Um, yeah, I don't have a copy of the agenda, so I don't know if this is on the agenda, but wondering if um, at some point would we be talking about the situation at 770 Eastern Parkway? Um, 
Uh, so I just wanted to ask that. Um, uh, is Hi, that Mr. Hollingsworth, that is not on our agenda and all of our agendas can be found on our website. Um, I'll gladly email it to you. Um, Suki, I guess that's something you may take up during public comment, but that is not a noted issue on the agenda. Yeah, it's not right, an so, item on, on our agenda, but you have your three minutes. Um, so I can I can talk about it later in public comment. This is our public comment session. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I just I just wanted to know if the if the if the uh, board had a a position on it. It's obviously a you know extremely dangerous situation. People are digging. They could have hit a uh, electrical lines. Um, sewage, the train station is not that far away from there. Um, you know, they could have damaged the foundation of other buildings. Um, so I just, well, I, I guess my question was if the community board was going to have a, you know, a statement on that or not, but it sounds like you all won't. Um, so thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Okay. Hollingsworth, um, the chair is the spokesman of the board and he has not released a statement on the matter as of yet. So any information that, that will be released or comment that will be released on a situation will be directly from the board chair and not committee chairs. Okay, thank you, right. Mr. Hollingsworth. Um, Mena, did you want to speak? No, I didn't. Thank okay. you. Uh, Yaakov? Yeah, I don't know what Hollingsworth is talking about, but the DOB was there, the police department was there, everything under control, but I'm happy that he is the one to raise awareness. And his record of anti-Semitism is very public and very clear, so just, Michael, just go for it, so we know exactly what you think about our community, and I'm happy you're once again showing it to the world. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Berman. Um, so we're going to move on now um, to discussion of the Green Fast Track Amendment, and this will be a business session um, because we are going to try to get through this resolution and um, uh, write something. Um, so why don't we just start with a review of what the green fast track amendment is all of the committee members should have received the documents the notice of proposal from the board office um does has everyone read this it's only about four pages does anyone want to summarize it for us any of the committee members esteban Esteban, you put your hand. You put your I hand. Able, I was able to unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, no, I had a comment about earlier, um, not about the green fast track. Sorry. Okay. Um, do you want to summarize green fast track for us? All right. Uh, sorry. That's it. That's going to add a lot of time that if we have to do that every time that we're that we unmute. Um, uh, no, I don't. I, I don't think I can provide a, a summary right now. If, if somebody else wants to do it, I haven't had a chance to look through it um, the way that I would like to. Okay. Anybody else? John. I really don't think I'm the right person to do this, but I will try. Uh, and I don't think I'm the right person because I know. I'm perceived as somebody who maybe has vested interests, but uh, I will try. And Suki, please correct me if I'm wrong or augment wherever I. Uh, okay, give uh, it a may... shot. And I'm okay. sure if somebody disagrees with you, they'll speak <laughs> up. <laughs> um, so the, the amendment is part of the mayor's um, a larger initiative to get stuff built, to make it easier to build things in the city. And I have to say, as an architect who practices in the city, it is very complicated to get anything built in the city. Uh, so I do appreciate the efforts that the mayor and the city are trying to do. I do think that the environmental review for ULERP um, is very complicated. 
I think it uh, in some ways is like a paperwork effort. Um, I think what's going to happen with this Euler process is the community board involvement does not go away. The ULERPs still come to the community board. It is trying to simplify the uh, the process. Uh, and the way that city planning is proposed to simplify the process is that they've looked at a thousand projects. I think, Suki, your, your request to get that data from city planning was, a, I think that's a good request so that we can wrap our heads around it as well. They found through evaluating these thousand projects that there was some simplification that could happen. So they've set some bars, uh, some thresholds that if, if projects are under that, they can have a simplified environmental analysis. For low, di for low density districts, R1 to R5, I think it was, it's mm -hmm. less than 175 units. So if you're less than 175 units, it simplifies that process. If you're R6 to R10, you've got a, and you have less than 250 units, you also can simplify the process. But if you're over either one of those thresholds, you still have to go through the standard, the current um, uh, environmental review. There's another metric that I'm I will done. actually- When you say simplify the process, does that mean they don't have to do an environmental assessment at all? I think it, become, it becomes a simpler environmental assessment. It just makes it easier. And it's, I, whether that- What, what a, does that mean? What do they get to leave out? They, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I don't know. Um, but that's, I'm not sure if that's in the four pages or not. I didn't see that sort of detail in the four page summary. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention, which is the 250 foot height permissiveness, which is another condition. So if you come in with 174 units in an R5 district, and you can somehow achieve a 250 foot building height, that would be permitted. If you wanted to do 260 feet, you couldn't do that. I have a hard time believing that you could actually come in with a 260 foot building in an R5 district or a 250 foot building. So um, I'm not quite sure why that height is in there. I think it should, it would be better if that height limits or that height metric was calibrated to neighborhoods context, uh, like Midtown Manhattan, 250 feet might be fine, but in CB9 in Brooklyn, 250 feet would, in my mind, absolutely require some sort of environmental assessment for shadow impact, uh, uh, other things like that. So that's my best attempt at summarizing. I know I probably left a lot out and you asked a good question, Suki, that I don't know the answer to. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to share the screen of the, okay, so this is, what it says here. Um, to address this, the city agencies that develop or approve housing, including um, the mayor's office, blah, 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 um, each adopting a new type two rule under CECRA and CEQR to exempt housing development up to a certain size from environmental review. So I don't think it's a simple, it sounds to me, John, like it's not a simplified process. They're going to exempt these housing developments from um, CEQR and SEQR review. So um, in addition to the 250 foot height limit, in order to be eligible um, for exemption, it cannot be um, in a sensitive natural resource area. Um, it cannot be substantially contiguous to um, a public park or open space. Um, it would have to be determined by landmarks that the project site is not archeologically sensitive. Um, an action involving the removal or alteration of significant natural resources shall remain subject to environmental review, cannot be wholly or partially within any historic building, structure, facility, site, or district that is calendared for consideration or eligible for designation as a New York City landmark. 
um, cannot be substantially contiguous to any historic building structure facility site or district designated calendar for consideration or eligible for designation. Um, wholly or partially within or substantially contiguous to anything that is eligible for listing on the state register of historic places or national register of historic places. Um, yeah. So the one question I would have here is when they say calendar for consideration or eligible for designation, what does eligible for designation mean? Be be because John, do you have an answer for that? Because my understanding is that eligible means any building that's at least 50 years old. That's it. So unless they mean something different. Um, John, you had an answer? Yes. Um, so eligible actually means it's on uh, LPC's radar that they are considering whether it is um, eligible to be a landmark. So it just means if it's if it's being considered, it may not have got fully through the process. Um, so that's what that means. So actually, I think these these are actually a lot of I think really common sense controls that uh, do allow for um, project sites that might potentially have negative impacts uh, to have like a, a shutoff valve, like an automatic shutoff valve. If it's, if it's in a historic district, if it's near something that's sensitive. Um, another piece of this that I didn't focus on, which is why it's called green fast track, is there are other requirements for these projects to be eligible. One is that they have to be all electric, which is supporting the city and the state's um, desire to electrify buildings and and decrease the uh, uh, emissions of fossil fuel from fossil fuel burning. And another is actually another very sensical thing is to not, for sites not to be located in flood prone areas. So um, I do think that there are some reasonable controls in here that don't make this a blanket thing across the entire city. Um, one other thing that I'll point out is that the SECRA, S-E-Q, that's a state environmental quality review and Seeker, the C, is city environmental. So when you see those abbreviations, it means those two things. Okay, thank you. Um, so I see three members, two, two members of the public have raised their hands. Although we, you know, passed by the public session, there were not a lot of people. So I'm going to recognize you guys. Um, again, you know, I'm asking Mia to keep time. Um, Mia, three minutes. Um, Andrew, I think we saw you first, and then Alicia. Hi, yes. Um, this wasn't part of the public comment. I want to clarify something that you said earlier, that they're not re removing the, the seeker process. They're expanding the type two list, which is the no expected adverse impacts. And I will also point out that even if something is on this type one list, it doesn't always get public review anyway. They might not determine any significant impacts, which is what the majority of things that DCP had highlighted, which is not going to be not available for public review, public scoping, or public comment. So you still have to fill out a form. It's much smaller, but it still is like a four-page form. It has several attachments. It's not nothing. And then the other thing that I want to say is I was I was upset yesterday to hear about you know, how, how bad this was going to be. And people brought up the Franklin rezoning and a lot of that work going on. And th that wouldn't qualify for this straight up. It is a ULERP, it is in ULERP, so it would already have to go through in more intensive environmental review. The site has an E designation given its previous use as part of the spice factory complex. And it also was not fully electric. So it doesn't make that green carve out. I, I just want to be really clear that I, I support this. I think it does a lot of good and it actually you know, should reduce the cost of housing, which is an important contributor to the price of living in the city. Anyway, that not public review, point of clarification, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for your comment. Um, Alicia? Of course, developers and 
people who work for developers would love to have this because what it does is just allows another development project that will build up to 25 stories not to have a type two, not to be a part of type one and be allowed to not do any type of environmental review. However, as we stated before, currently we are a low rise community made up of the majority of four to five story buildings. 25 stories is a huge, will make a huge impact upon our community not only in uh, certain areas visually, contextually, but it also can have a detrimental effect upon the racial impact. A racial impact analysis will not be done because this will be considered a type two and thus will not have to have any type of review and let you will now have monstrosities all over our community just popping up everywhere with no environmental review. Secondly, as I've stated before, the environmental review process, the first part, the EAS is which they have to go through currently is not that long. It doesn't take eight months. It's not hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a checklist for the most part. Sometimes if it's next to a sensitive ecosystem, they might have to do a shadow study, but it's not in depth. It's the EIS that's in depth that takes months and months and money. So the fact that, oh my God, you know, they're gonna save money. And what we always know, and we've seen this time and time again, is they build the buildings, it's cheaper for them, but that doesn't get transferred into the rents being cheaper. That only gets transferred or more money in their pockets. Where have you seen where they get, you know, the free this and they get the free this and they get that and all of a sudden our rents are cheaper. That's not, it doesn't happen. There's no such thing as that. And yet you have developers and architects and everybody who make tons of money off these properties talking about, oh, we're going to save so much money and it's going to, you know, be beneficial to the public when we know the public has not benefited from any of the free things that have been given to developers, including tax breaks and increased FAR and all this other stuff that they get. And finally, sometimes these environmental impacts require like sewage upgrades. They require parts of our community to be considered for support. Without an EIS or, or without an EAS, which will not have an EIS, all of those structural supports that will be needed in the community will be gone. They, they won't exist. You won't have to do it. So you can put a whole slew of 25 story buildings in our community and not have to make any contribution to oh, the soup. 15 seconds. To to the police department, to the sanitation department. The, the developers would just be able to build as of right most of the time because DCP's approval is 99% approval rate. We should have that's three that's minutes. It. And that's it. Also, I wanted to find out what time is this meeting going to end? Uh, we are scheduled to end at 8.30, Alicia, um, but that is dependent on, as you know, um, members of the committee may call for a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Um, okay, does there anyone else have any comments? Rod? Hello, everyone. So I, I guess my concern with this, um, with the lack of the process, is that the load growth, the electric load growth within the city is going to drastically increase uh, if we are going to have these buildings built without this review. Uh, when the grid is analyzed over a period of time, uh, it, it does take you know, kind of, they do look at low growth and they have a very good idea of how the low growth takes place. This is going to be a very expansive issue. And I feel that, you know, all the utility companies need to be involved because they're going to have to fund all this fast tracking, um, you know, improvements on their, on their equipment. And I don't think that it's going to go smoothly. I and mean, that's just my opinion, you know, being a person who has boots on the ground, because there's maintenance that's involved with this equipment as well as you know, improvements. And I feel that you're going to see skyrocketing utility rates. I mean, that's that's what's going to happen. The more infrastructure you build, 
you know, it's, it, it takes money to maintain it. And if it goes real quick, you know, it's going to be a, an infusion of cash that's needed. That, that's my opinion. Yeah. Um, thank you for your comment, Rod. Uh, anybody else? Okay, so um, I will make my comment. May I give me three minutes? Um, which is, I, I do agree with Alicia. I agree with Rod. Um, I'm just kind of concerned that uh, if we're eliminating um, environmental review, if it is supposed to be something that takes six to eight months and costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, presumably that means a lot of detailed analysis is involved. And if that's the case, that suggests that there is a real environmental issue. There is something to be investigated and there is something that the public and the elected officials should be alerted to. If it really, you know, is not necessary, as they say, because it's not a significant impact, right? Then as Alicia says, I agree, it's just ticking boxes. I've seen these environmental assessments too. And most of the time the developers just tick the box no. Um, so, you know, I kind of don't see the need for this, um, it, you know, but, uh, and so one of the questions that I was asking last night was how much does it cost given a certain size of project? Because if it costs a hundred thousand dollars, um, for a 100 or 300 unit project that costs tons of millions or hundreds of millions, that's not a significant increase at all in cost um, on a per unit basis. It doesn't matter, right? Um, you know, what it, but on the other hand, if it's if it's a very small project, you know, five, 10, 20 units, I think it's highly unlikely that it costs that much at all. And, you know, the architects get, if you, you know, disagree, you can, you can certainly say you have the experience doing this, but, you know, as a lawyer, I, I, I'm sure there would be lawyers who would do those environmental reviews for clients all day, you know, for $5,000, $10,000 on these smaller projects. If it's just, you know, if, if they're, if it's not significant, if the if the impacts are not significant and no detailed analysis is truly required. Um, so that's that's my concern is that in removing this rule, we're actually removing analysis for projects that's significant and important, even if it's only a subset of the projects. Okay, John, I see you. Yeah. Um, I also, I just want to point out that Tom Thomas has been waving his hand. I think he wants to say something. Ah, okay. Um, but, but I also, I just want to, I want to respond to something that uh, maybe isn't a, um, a complete answer, but the, the process does take time, even if it's simple and it does because, and, and believe me, I'm, I am no fan of, uh, city planning when it comes to how inefficient they are when, and, and. Believe me, I, I do ULERPs. This is something that I do as a profession. So I know the process. I know the time it takes. When an environmental uh, form and submission is made to the environmental folks at Department of City Planning, they have a whole division that looks at nothing but environmental stuff. It takes them forever to review it. You might wait two, three, four months to get their initial feedback and they might have some comments they might and they might be like nothing comments but you've got to respond to them maybe they are more substantial but it does take time and it usually takes two three sometimes four reviews to have that process completed so it does add time um i can't say for sure that it's not um a valuable part of the process for some sites um so I, I just want to get that feed or that, that information, that perspective out there for why it might take so much time. Um, and the cost, is, you know, time is money. So the cost is the cost. I, I take them at their word. Maybe I'm a fool for that. But $100,000 doesn't sound like um, um, an outrageous uh, amount of time for someone to do this process, to go back to it three, four times. So I'm just giving you that that professional perspective. Take it for what for what it's worth, or how you want to perceive it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, John. 
so Tom, I apologize. I, I can't see your picture when I'm doing this. I can only see if a hand is raised. Mia, I'm asking Tom to unmute, but he's not unmuting. Okay. I'm okay, got gotcha. you. Okay. Yep. Yes, okay. So I have no problem with uh, expediting any process in the New York City development um, realm. Um, Many, or if not most, of the projects don't require extensive review. But it's necessary. Alicia raised many issues that would be pertinent to uh, a limited number of those applications. Those, there should be recourse to the decision to move something rapidly through a process if people believe that the review in that particular development requires it. So let, let everything go through quickly if it has no opposition. But if there is opposition or concern, then there needs to be a procedure for recourse and challenge. That's my comment on this. Thank you, Tom. Um, okay, are there any other comments? Okay, so I'm gonna take a stab at, you know, putting together people's comments into a very brief resolution. Um, let's start with uh, Tom's um, and John's. Uh, let's say we CB9, believes the environmental review process can be expedited in terms of how long it takes city planning to review applications. However, we are concerned about the loss of review um, for sensitive or contentious um, developments. Um, how does that sound? Felice. Hello. Um, I hope this is in the realm of uh, this unit process that we're speaking of. Um, I understand that the um, the project here on Franklin Avenue with Spice Factory once stood, the owner wants to build uh, 25 storage high um, are we still looking to protect the botanical gardens is my question. Um, yeah, we're not actually talking about that right now. We're talking about no, the No, I, I know, but after I heard, mm -hmm, I just, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm interjecting this only because I heard uh, something different that's taking place here and I didn't want to lose the focus of protecting the botanical gardens. So I just wanted to interject that. Okay. I mean, we can definitely incorporate that into our comment that we're concerned about um, shadows and sensitive sites like the Botanic Gardens. Please. Um, okay. Nicola? Thank you. Nicola? Nicola. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. My concern from the beginning has been that this type of um, 
process would give incentives to developers to underestimate the number of units, the number of floors in order to um, get under the radar, have a fast track, and then after the fact, change their, their scope and their definitions. And um, larger projects, I, I had mentioned Franklin Avenue, not that that project itself would, would qualify for this program, but a block like that where you have a development that could be broken up into several separate projects, each falling under the radar and qualifying as a type one, I guess. And then after the fact, you see that, wait a minute, we, have, we now have two city blocks that are now under development. So I would like some type of a, one, I'm against this because of that, but then also I continue to stress that we need some type of cumulative impact assessment. And if we see that there are a number of projects in a defined area, like a city block, that automatically triggers an environmental review, no matter what type, if they fell under type one, type two, they all go under an environmental assessment to make sure that we understand the cumulative impact to a neighborhood. Okay, so do you see? Do you guys see what I'm writing? Um, I'm just taking down what you guys are saying. No, we see the old. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So you guys see that I'm 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 just like taking it down. I have some typos. <laughs> um, Okay, so CB9 believes that instead we need cumulative environmental review for all projects within a certain radius, whether they are type one or type two projects. Okay, and I saw John's hand go up. Um, oh gosh. Okay. John. Thanks, yep. So I also, I'd like to just bring up something else that I mentioned earlier that I would like to see you incorporated into this, which is that 250 foot height and modulating that and making it more um, calibrated to an existing community's context and not just letting that 250 foot height apply anywhere. This is actually something that um, Alicia brought up last night and I appreciate that. I think it's a, a very insightful comment. Um, and also, um, um, Felice, I think, and I don't know this for sure, maybe other people on the call who are more experts at environmental, I think, when that environment, whether it's a type one or a type two, there's a negative declaration that gets issued that's for the property. And it, it identifies the number of units and other elements of the project that are being proposed. So if there was to be like a bait and switch that would then conflict with the negative declaration, I think that would be like the, that would be the, the restriction that wouldn't allow that to happen. But I'd like to have that fact checked by others on the call if that's uh, if I'm wrong about that. Well, that's kind of what happened with Franklin Avenue. They came in under the radar, and as a result, they didn't have to do a, a full EIS. And then after the flat, when they filed with the DOB, their plans had the number of units that would have triggered an EIS. And no one flagged it. No one went back and said, oh, but this, this is the bait and switch. It just continued forward until a lawsuit was filed. So it happens currently.
Okay. Um, so are you guys seeing what I'm writing? Okay. And I'm going to add one last thing um, because, oh, Esteban, I haven't. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, Esteban. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have the same the same comment that um that uh that Nicholas said. I I mean, I think we have a clear example. Um, actually, the the building across the street from me just topped out. Um, they get seventeen stories. Uh, even when they do, uh, even even as it is right now, developers are not abiding by the by the law and then when they don't do it not even the courts are enforcing it uh let alone dcp who was just like just didn't care so um to me i think to trust that developers or dcp are going to um uh, are going to even follow what they're proposing is ludicrous because that's not what's happened in you know in in practice or not what happens in practice and we have a very clear example of that um so yeah i i think i think this is I think it's important to note that that um or somehow note here that you know if if they were doing a better job of actually enforcing the rules that exist then you know maybe we would be a little bit more amenable to uh to allowing changes like that but otherwise i don't see why we would why we would want to do that um you know to just give them more opportunity to fly under the radar which is just like their their basic mo so yeah, that's good to know. Thanks, Esteban. Um, okay, so I'm going to add one more thing. Um, the thing about this process, right, it's a rule change. It is not a Euler process. That means the city council technically does not have to vote on this. This is something that can be done by authority of the mayor's office, assuming two things. First of all, that this rule change is does not significantly affect any rights or um of 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 the public that are given under this this rule. So first of all, there's the question of whether this type of a change is allowed to be done by a rule change at all. Um, second of all, obviously it is the council that has rulemaking authority authority, you know, that has legislative authority and that has the authority to pass amendments to the CEQR, um, the City Environmental Quality Review. Um, so my suggestion here would, in, in terms of having the maximum impact, is we may want to ask the City Council to pass environmental review laws, new laws, that actually say what we want them to do. And so as Nicola was saying, we want the cumulative environmental review for all projects. And I would even take that further and say, not just for rezonings, um, but for all development that has happened in a district, um, let's say in the last decade, right? Like let's say there's been more than a 5% increase in the number of housing units, or more than a 10% increase in population in a district um, over a decade, then uh, there needs to be an environmental review by the city agencies. Um, that, and that's something that they need to do proactively. Um, so kind of like what Rod was saying that, uh, you know, all of these projects are putting a strain on the electrical grid. They could all be very small. They could all be as of right, but we don't know that unless we demand the environmental review. Um, so that, that's something I'd like to add to this as well. Uh, Alicia. Um, I'm not sure the state already has that, right? The state already has in their own, the secret, which states that anytime you're looking to change the zoning, you have to create an environmental assessment you have to look at the environmental assessment. So this is already written in the law. What's happening is that the city is now deciding to add an exemption to that law. So I'm not sure if asking for the city council to do what the state has already done and kind of 
go against what the city of yes is trying to do makes much sense. But if you want to ask for it, fine, you ask for it, it doesn't make sense. But I do know that it is very clear when we went to court of the switch and bait with the lack of cumulative impacts, with the fact that developers don't adhere to the current laws when it comes to environmental impacts. We did win in the lower court. So the lower courts do support us. Um, but once we got to the second department, you know, we lost. And that's a very common condition. Almost 100% of zoning challenges that occur in the lower courts and when we lose it on appeal. Um, so I would ask that this committee, because they claim that they base this on evidence, I would ask the committee to please ask the Department of City Planning officially in writing for their studies. They claim that this is based upon a thousand, you know, so let's see the studies. I would like to see the studies. Let's look at the studies and let's see what the studies are saying because then that would give us more support in pushing back against this if we can see that the studies, what the study says. So I would ask the committee to please think about passing a, a motion to ask the Department of City Planning to please produce the studies which gave them the evidence that this was not needed for buildings of 25 stories or less. Thank you. Okay, I'm writing that down, Alicia. And then I think um, we need to call for a vote. Okay, done. Guys, uh, apart from my horrible typos, um, I'm going to read this out to you. Um, you're going to give me your um, amendments, and then we're going to take a vote. And that will be, the vote will be in business session. Okay. CB9 believes the environmental review process can be expedited in terms of how long it takes city planning to review applications. However, we are concerned about the loss of review for sensitive or contentious developments. In particular, we believe that the limits stated for exemption should be calibrated to the context of the community. 250 feet tall is too high for a community like CB9, where such a project should be reviewed for shadow impacts. And projects contiguous with the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens should also be reviewed for shadow impact, even though the BBG is not a public park. In addition, this exemption would give developers to under, uh, oh no, I guess not in addition. I maybe, we are concerned, we are concerned that this exemption would give incentives to developers to understate the number of units to evade environmental review and later increase them or split projects into smaller projects that fall under the project limits. Um, CB9 believes that instead we need cumulative environmental review for all projects within a certain radius, whether they are type one or type two projects. In fact, we call on the city council to pass legislation requiring comprehensive environmental reviews for all development, both as of right or via rezoning within a community district within a decade, anytime there is a 5% or greater increase in the number of housing units or a 10% or greater increase in population. Finally, we call on the Department of City Planning to produce the data and studies of 1,000 environmental applications over the past decade in support of the Green Fast Track Amendment to eliminate certain types of review. Okay, should I say to produce to the public? 
or no, to make available share. to the public, to, to share with the public and this community board. Okay. All right. So, um, comments, alterations. Do we need to state straight out, do are we in favor of this fast track, green fast track or not? Um, well, that's up to you guys. Do you, do you want us to, Nicola? I would like to say on the record, are we in favor of this? I am not. And I, I, and did we put in here Esteban's statement about the fact that they are not adhering to the current laws? Therefore, we don't want to give them more opportunities. Um, no, we can put that in there. Let me see. And that could be why we oppose this, because they're not adhering to the current laws. And now we are loosening the okay. laws and making it more flexible. Current laws requiring environmental review. Do we want to say anything more about that? Like which specific project we're talking about or? Esteban? It's... Yeah, I mean, the, the Franklin Avenue rezoning, I think is the, the official name of it. Um, the, you know, that when we, we brought these concerns to them before it was ever approved and they ignored them and then you know, had to take them to court and unfortunately lost at the appellate level, but like, but the, the facts didn't change. They they did not abide by the, by the rules. Like they just okay, didn't. So help me out here. Developers such as who, what, who was it? Um, the names keep changing. So I would just refer to the project. Okay. Yeah, so how do you yeah. want to, how do you want to refer to it? Because now we have a whole different Franklin Avenue rezoning. So Maybe the 2017 Franklin Avenue rezoning. You put it that way. Yes, Fi yes that Fice right? Factory has another name. Yeah, I think if you say 2017 Franklin Avenue rezoning, then that that specifies enough. Okay. Yeah, I think that that works. Okay, so other committee members, um, to Nicholas' point, do we want to say explicitly that we are opposed to the Green Fast Track Amendment? Don't all raise your hands at once. Yakov. Just just a quick comment about I know about this document on um, the Franklin Avenue. Is that is that something which is both parties are in agreement that they're not adhering to current laws, or is this what the petitioners are claiming? So because if it is only one side, we should use language like alleged or allegedly without stating a position. Because I'm not familiar with the laws and I haven't read through the court case and I don't know if it makes sense to take a position as facts. Again, I'm not saying, I just, I'm not familiar with all the details. I'm wondering if this is a, a matter of dispute or this is a fact. If it's a matter of disputes, uh, just to change to the 2017 Franklin Avenue are, are allegedly not by petitioners or allegedly that way we just, it's, it's, it's just, I guess, probably the correct way to do it. Okay, so um, here's what I'm going to do. Developments such as the 2017 Franklin Avenue rezoning 
resulted in um, community member um, Franklin Avenue rezoning Let's see. Environmental reviews for development such as the 2000 Franklin Avenue rezoning <clears throat> have been disputed. Resulting in lengthy Court cases. Okay, and you know what? This actually goes up right at the top under, however, we are concerned about the loss of review for sensitive or contentious developments. It goes right there. The accuracy of environmental reviews for developments such as the 2017, right? Because that's what we're talking about, these contentious developments. Does that work for people? Alicia? Um, the lower court did agree with us. And so that's really important. So you had a legal challenge where the lower court said, and it was on this specific issue. That was the, the thing. There were a lot of challenges to that lawsuit, but they specifically stated in the findings that the judge found that Cornell Realty Management, who was the developers at the time, failed to conduct an EIS because they fabricated and underrepresented the numbers on their application. So this this that app that lawsuit specifically addressed this issue. It wasn't like it was we had a lot of other issues in that lawsuit. What did the higher court say? Well the higher court made the claim, and again we understand that, that his math was wrong. They didn't give an explanation of why the math was wrong. They didn't show what math they were talking about, right? But what the issue is, is that you did have a court. You did have a court that stated that it was wrong. And what we believe in those thousand applications, they make the claim that there's no courts that ever stated that they were wrong. And we know that that's not true. We know that courts have stated very clearly that the way in which EIS is all avoided. This is the common challenge that we do in court is on environmental review. And there has been numerous cases where the lower courts have said, yes, you did not do that right. Yes, you underrepresented the numbers. So in this case, we did get a positive thing. Now we went to the second department and yes, there's a 100% overturn, 100%. So one would argue that with a hundred percent overturn that there's no justice in the appellate court. But what is clear is that a body, an independent judicial body did recognize this as an issue and made a declaration in an order that it is an issue. And that's what's important. Okay, thank you. Um, Esteban. Yeah, no, and, and just point out, I think, Part of what I what I was getting at is that we raised these concerns while we were still in the process. Like we raised these concerns from the start and talked to the council member and uh, and talked to DCP and brought it up over and over and over again in public forums and public settings. And even that was not enough for them to look into it. Um, so yeah, so that's to, to me the point is that it's like as a community we don't even have the uh, we don't even have the ability to stop them from continuing on even when we show them evidence you know what i mean so it's 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 less about what the actual uh what the actual outcome was even than it was about them not giving us the the opportunity to to you know, i mean they didn't even listen to the concerns whatsoever so um to me that's at least for me that's that's the more important thing because uh you know the courts are going to do whatever the the whatever they want to do politically um especially in brooklyn um you know the and and the way that they're they're tied to the Democratic Party is you know we we know how that works but 
Uh, but I think that the point is that there's not a point, there's not a uh, lower courts are tied to the Socialist Party. How does it work? The higher courts, the Democratic uh, Party. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. Yakov. Yakov, you, you cannot do that. And I'm sorry, but nobody else uh, interrupted you. So please stop. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Esteban. Um, so here's what I, I, I think to, to your last point, maybe this is what we should add, that um, environmental review, environmental reviews provide a crucial tool for the community to understand and um, to understand a project's impacts and what would you say do you think like I, I kind of what I kind of want to say is like express their voice you know opinion or express their voice but that's not quite the right language what do you guys think is um right I mean it's it's I think what you're really saying um, and what Alicia has said before too, is it's really one of the few avenues for a community. And Tom was kind of saying this too, it's really one of the few avenues um, for a community to um, bring their concerns about a project to the fore in many cases. Uh, understand project impacts and raise concerns. Okay. Okay, all right, we need to vote. Um, if there is nothing else pressing, I mean, typos will be fixed, I promise you. Uh, I'm gonna take a, take attendance. John Craver. I am present. Can we okay. vote on this or just take an attendance? Uh, why don't we vote at the same time that we took oh. attendance? How do you vote? Generally in favor of this. I, I, if we could be more specific about what we feel the height limit should be, or I mean, is it half of that? Is it 100 feet? Is it 75 feet? I mean, I think that's too tall, so it's like 200. Um, my concern is that that's very vague and open-ended and someone's going to come back and say, okay, we'll do a 225. We, may, we listened to you, we responded to you. That's, the, I think, the, the weak, weakest part of the, this thing. But generally, I agree with it. So I think that's my only point of contention. Okay. Um, do other people feel like we should put a specific height limit out there? I mean, I'm I'm in agreement with you, John. Um, but I um I'm also, you know, like kind of feel like we should see where we get with this and then, you know, start arguing hard for the maximum possible. <laughs> it's, it's just a matter know. of strategy, you know. Like I, you know, I don't even know where this is gonna go or or you know what the um all we can do is send this out to our elected officials really is all we can do. And then at that point, we may be able to, um, you know, see what they're willing to do for us. Hey, Suki, Mr. Thomas has his hand up. Tom. Uh, I'm not quite sure why an absolute height is required. It seems to me that, that the limits you want to place should uh, make the decision relative to the rest of the community. So if it's a if it's a single family community, two fifty is ridiculous. So maybe it should be a percentage of the average height of units in that particular community board. 
Yeah, I th I think that's not not a bad um statement. I mean, I at one point looked at at um you know what the majority of buildings were, and I I think we found that like ninety percent of them were five stories or less. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm just wondering whether you think the general statement that it should be calibrated to the context of the community, um, is, is sufficient. And then, like I said, you know, if we actually get elected officials, you know, moving in our direction, then we can start to, you know, put something specific on them. Is, is that in there someplace? The, the rel relative measurement uh, i think i said in particular we believe that the limit should be calibrated to the context of the yes, community. Okay. Yeah. i mean we can also note that most buildings in cb9 are less than 50 feet tall yeah of course does that work mm -hmm. okay okay all right, are we ready to vote? I think we really do have to vote, it's 826. Um, all right, so I'm gonna continue with attendance. Um, Pat Moses, oh, okay, so John Wolfling. Uh, presence. I'm going to abstain. Okay, thank you. Um, Pat Moses. Abstain. Okay. Um, Yakov Berman. Yeah, I'm. I'm very conflicted still, so I'm also going to abstain. Okay, Esteban Haron. Yes. Okay. Nicola Cox? Yes. Tom Thomas? Yes. Okay, and Suki Chiang? Yes. So um, let's see, Mia, we have four yeses, three absto, or we have five yeses and three abstentions. Is that correct? I believe so. Hold on a second. Yakov, you abstain, correct, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it passed. Okay, so the motion passes. Okay, so um before we conclude, um, I just want to make sure that you guys are aware that they there is a public information session on the Green Fast Track Amendment on January 29th that's being hosted by the Department of City Planning. And the City Planning Commission hearing, public hearing, will be on February 7th. Um, so you can all participate in that. Um, Dante has sent out the documents, including the EAS documents recently to all board members and resident committee members, I believe. Um, so I just want to make sure that you all got that and that you're all aware of that. Esteban? Yeah, um, I just I want to go back to um, during the, uh, the public session. Um, I think Michael had wanted to uh, make a, a comment and wasn't able to. Uh, could we unmute him? Yes. Thank you for that. And uh, thanks, Esteban. Um, I just like to note that um, Berman was allowed to call me an anti-Semite and there was zero pushback from this committee. Uh, if Berman has evidence of me being an anti-Semite other than his flapping lips, he should produce it. But as we know, white men like Berman are often allowed in these spaces to make, to make allegations and face no repercussions. Mm -hmm. Berman, you said that I'm known in your community well, I'd like to let you know that you're well known in my community as well. And it's good to see that in 2024, you continue to be the biggest anti black racist in all of Crown Heights. Thank you. Okay. Um, I hope we can avoid those types of comments by anyone in the future. I really do. 
So um, with that, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. And um, so Mia, we're going to forward the, this resolution. Esteban's hand is still raised. Did he have another comment? Um, Mia, can we forward this resolution to the executive committee to go to the general board? Yeah, you can just forward over the draft to the office and I'll have it prepared um, okay. to go out to the exec committee with the agenda next week. Okay, and it's to go out to, to all of our local elected officials. I just can't imagine who else would, yep. as well as the Department of City Planning, I guess. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Take care and have a good evening, everyone. Good night.